Hello! In this short video, I would like to introduce this third year course on chemical process design and to talk about the topic of design a little more generally. Design is a great area to work in, since it is as much about creativity and lateral thought as it is about crunching numbers. Depending who you talk to, you may hear that it's more about creativity than crunching numbers. Some of the best engineering designers that I know who work in or who have worked in a variety of different engineering disciplines are also some of the most original thinkers that I know of. Invariably, they tend to always demonstrate that the best solution to an engineering problem by far is usually the most elegant and the most simple. I'd like to take a few minutes now to remind you that engineering is one of the most essential, relevant and interesting fields to work in, to give you some background information on how I've put this course together, and then to give you an overview of what we're going to cover and how it'll be assessed. Let's start by thinking about the word engineer. This might seem as a bit of a surprise, but you're all sitting this course and you're all studying to be engineers. But it seems that people don't very often think about the origin of the word and what it means. When I ask folk what they think about engineering, they think, oh, engines, wrong, no. Let's look back to the word's roots. If we look at the Latin, ingenare, it means to create, to generate, to contrive or to devise. And it's inextricably linked with ingenium, which is cleverness. Think about the word ingenuity. That is the true root of the word engineer. It's about being ingenious. It's about solving real world problems. It's about finding clever, neat solutions that are simple, that work, that are safe, that are cost effective, and that solve a variety of societal and global needs. Where you're sitting right at the moment, you probably associate engineering with a lot of this sitting down, doing exams. Whilst this is an essential component of engineering training, accruing the knowledge that you'll then build into a toolkit and that toolkit that you'll then deploy to solve problems, it's not what engineering's about. The sort of problems that you solve in an examination situation are typically closed, typically short, and typically under a great deal of pressure. It's not to say that engineering sometimes isn't under a great deal of pressure as well, but the sort of problems that you work on are far more project-based, far more broad in scope, and usually very ill-defined. If we think about some of the big chemical engineering challenges going forward from now, we'll see that we've got things like climate change, the energy transition, sustainable manufacturing, how to make clean water for all globally, how do you make safe food for all globally, how do we do new pharmaceuticals manufacture on a global scale, particularly relevant in this year 2020? How do we harness biotechnology to make cleaner processes? These are all huge, huge problems to solve, notably climate change, notably the energy transition, notably issues of sustainability. Engineering and chemical engineering is key to solving these problems. And engineering creativity is going to be the enabling factor that allows engineers to solve these problems in a timely way that works and that can be delivered and that can be delivered globally and that can be delivered in such a way such that anybody can actually use it. <clears throat> so I don't think it's unfair to say that engineering creativity is key to the human species survival and the fact that you're all studying to be engineers is really, really great. Let me talk a little bit about this course. The idea is that this course is a little bit different from a standard lecture course. So I'd like to keep you excited about engineering and it's particularly about engineering design. But whilst doing this, I'd also like to give you some more information to fill in the blanks that exist between different lecture courses that you've already sat. You'll see how this is embodied when I talk about the material that we're going to be covering. I'd also like to give you some practical applied material that can be used to deliver a piece of safe engineering. You already know a lot of engineering theory from your other lecture courses, but sometimes these can be woefully thin on how you actually apply it in the real world, what the practical constraints of a situation are. So what I also want you to do is to think laterally and to learn to keep an open mind when you start to think about problem solving. And there's a very important concept that I'll introduce in a minute, which I like to term problem abstraction. Don't get too bought into one particular way of doing things. It's not the way to solve problems cleverly. I want you to think about neat, elegant solutions to problems that are safe and that work. 
And now remember as well that there is elegance and robustness in simplicity. All too many times I see people, especially early on in their engineering career, going to solve a problem and come up with this incredibly complex thing that solves that problem. Then the experienced engineer will turn around and go, well done, nice piece of work. But have you thought of? And the subject of have you thought of is usually something beautifully elegant, beautifully simple hence robust, hence safe, hence operable, hence manufacturable, hence usable. So please don't forget that you don't have to overcomplicate things. In fact, I'd encourage you never to overcomplicate things. Aim for simplicity. Aim for elegance. Let's think of a little scenario which involves problem abstraction and elegant solutions. And I'd like to dedicate this to Professor Ken Wallace, who is one of my uh, lecturers in engineering design who unfortunately passed away in 2018. Take the following scenario. You're mowing the lawn. It's a lovely sunny day and you're just out mowing the lawn. Everything's going fine. Then all of a sudden your lawnmower expires on you. You're a little bit miffed by this but you think, ah, damn, I'm an engineer, I can solve this problem. I can mend the lawnmower. Hmm, do you really want to mend the lawnmower? What is it you're trying to achieve here? Maybe then you go away and think, and then as an engineer you come up with an idea and you think, well, let's think about this. I might be mowing the lawn, but what I'm actually trying to achieve here is just keeping the grass short. So rather than mending the lawn mower, what I need to do is to find a means of keeping the grass short. And then suddenly, if you think in that more abstract way, a whole variety of solutions present themselves to you. Mowing the lawn with a mechanical device is one of them, but only one of them. And the embodiment of that mechanical device almost looks like a, an irrelevant detail at this point. And so, being an open-minded kind of a person, you think, well, I know. I'll keep the grass short. I'll get some sheep. They can look after the lawn, and they can fertilise the lawn, and it gives a little bit of company around the place too. Fine. OK. So keep your problems abstracted. Think about what it is you're trying to achieve rather the usual embodiment by which it can be achieved. Don't think about the embodiment, don't focus on that. Think about the problem you're solving. And you may well come up with a neat and elegant solution to that problem. Let me talk a little bit about the course structure and about the sort of content that's in the course. So first of all, this is a course of 12 lectures. Here are the lectures and their respective topics. I'm going to be lecturing eight of these topics, and my colleague, Dr Cameron Eunice, is going to be lecturing four of these topics. My eight lectures are in blue, Dr Eunice's lectures are in purple. So, if we look at the detail of these, we'll see that these lectures break down into two blocks of six. This first block of six le lectures is what I call process building blocks, and let's look at what that covers. First of all, it covers how we communicate as engineers, how we communicate diagrammatically with process flow diagrams and piping and instrumentation diagrams, a very important enabling subject that allows us to put processes together in teams and for everybody to be working to the same design. Lectures two through four, I'm going to be filling in some blanks from some of your reactor engineering courses. Your reactor engineering courses have usually considered, I want to design a reactor. We're going to look at all the ways a reactor can be kinetically limited. And we'll base our reactor design around this kinetic limitation, which gives us our volume, which then gives us something that we can aim for in terms of a data sheet or include on a PNID. Whilst that's absolutely correct, it's not complete. Because if we think in the multi-phase world, your reactor may well not be limited by kinetics. It may be limited by mass transfer, and it is designing the volume for the mass transfer that then gives you your mechanical design. So I want to talk about multi-phase reactors. I want to talk about mass transfer limitation to chemical reactions. I want to talk about some of the thermal effects that we see. I want to talk a bit about reactor modelling, how you can write your own reactor model codes, and then a bit about mechanical design of reactors. In this process building block section, we're then going to talk about distillation. You'll have done a lot of distillation already. I want to specifically talk about distillation optimization, how we go from an initial design through to an optimised design, and we're going to optimise based on energy, and then how we go and take that into a mechanical design, something that we can sit down with the mechanical engineers of our discipline and say, right, 
from a process standpoint, this is what I need. This is how it's configured for its hydraulics. This is how I think it's going to be laid out in terms of internals and in terms of connections. It's up to you now to go and do the finite element work for all the stresses and all the strains and to come up with the final mechanical design. But you need to be able to have that conversation and to be able to have enough information at your fingertips to answer the mechanical engineer's questions. We're then going to talk about further separations. We're going to talk about, well, how do you separate gases from solids and solids from solids and liquids from liquids and liquids from gases and so on and so forth. And so there's a whole branch more equipment that is involved in these kind of operations. So that's the first block of six lectures. It's process building blocks, unit operations that perform a task that is vital to the delivery of our flow sheet. The second block of six lectures are what I'm terming process support. It's in effect how we connect up these unit operations and some of the things that we need to think about in terms of providing them with heat, with safety, with power. And so lecture seven is going to be talking about conveying materials and we'll see that it's about much more than just shoving stuff down a pipe because we might be dealing with solids. We might need conveyors, mechanical conveyors or pneumatic conveyors. We're going to be talking about regulating that material flow in lecture eight valving effectively but how do you effectively control the flow of material to a set of given constraints what sort of valves do you use mechanically well, how are they designed what can they do what can't they do we're then going to talk about pressure safety very very important topic because any pressure vessel of which pretty much every unit operation will be encapsulated in has to be safe and one of the ways in which they can become unsafe very rapidly is due to overpressure and we'll see that a lot of accidents within the chemical industry in the past have been caused by overpressure events. So we need to ensure that whatever we design does not fail due to an overpressure event and that we can actually do something with the material that's at overpressure such that we can keep everything mechanically safe. Lecture 10, we're going to talk about plant layout. The subject there is you've got a process flow sheet. You've got all the process flow diagrams. You've even got your piping and instrumentation diagrams. What's it physically look like on the ground? How do we design that? Where are we going to place unit operations with respect to one another? How are we going to use things like gravity to flow materials around? What structural steelwork do we need? What regulations underpin that? How do we segregate different parts of a plant based on safety concerns? The final two lectures are going to be looking at how we provide heat and power and other utilities to a plant. So lecture 11 is going to be all around general utilities, steam, nitrogen, compressed air. Lecture 12 is going to be dedicated to electrical power, not only in terms of utility, but also as a kind of a feedstock to electrochemical processes as well. So for this note, for this course, I'm providing a full set of notes for you. They'll be on Moodle. They've been updated for this year. And hopefully you'll find that a very useful reference to this set of online lectures. Now, for the lectures that I'll be taking, the eight lectures, each lecture is going to be broken into either three or four parts. And each of those parts is going to contain a particular topic or subtopic. Now, for lectures two to five, the first part of each lecture is going to be an example of neat lateral thought and nice engineering problem solving. Now, when I give these lectures in person, this is usually the sort of gap that you use to fill that time between walking into an empty lecture room with maybe one person there and the final sort of third years drifting in after they finish their cups of tea, maybe a few minutes late, dare I say. So in the spirit of that, have a cup of tea ready for this and let's sit, sit down and think about how we neatly solve problems. And I hope the sorts of things I'm going to be talking about will be both interesting, but also spur you to think about how to use lateral thought and solving the concept of a problem rather than worrying about the embodiment of a particular technology. So all the videos of my lectures will be on YouTube. There'll be links from Moodle to YouTube. There'll be embedded videos within, within Moodle as well. Um, however, there's nothing to stop you going back to YouTube and referring it back to those videos at your leisure. Also on Moodle, I'll be putting some supplementary material. Hopefully this will help you build your background knowledge and give you some more detailed information as and when it's required. Finally, let's talk about course assessment. It's not the thing I like to talk about, but you'll be glad to hear that this course is not assessed by examination. 
This doesn't mean that you should completely ignore this course because it is assessed by project work, which is far closer to the sorts of work that you'll be doing as an engineer. So in the May term, you will be setting a design project. It's worth roughly one and a half Tripos papers. And it's also a key thing that fulfills the academic requirements for your future chartered engineer professional qualification. So please look at this course in the context of taking that first step into thinking about being a chartered engineer and an engineering professional. Your design project in the May term will be done in groups of four to five students over five weeks and is done after your Tripos exams. So I hope that's something that you actually enjoy and get a lot out of. And I hope that this is a course that you also enjoy and get a lot out of.